Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Downey and today we are going to be talking about a rather important topic. I've spoken about it in the past, but I think it needs to be discussed again because I frequently get questions around this topic. And the topic is around how you can use steroids as safely as possible. Now, I don't condone the use of steroids, but I would like to help people reduce the risks that come with them. So I'll probably be making a series of videos discussing ways that steroids cause side effects and how we can prevent them. One of the most important ones is blood pressure regulation. And these are the questions that I commonly get asked. They're usually around drugs such as telmisartan and abivalol. And I'm going to demonstrate why these drugs still have a place in bodybuilding when it comes to steroid use. But we're going to cover other important topics in this video. So one of the ways in which steroids cause unwanted side effects in the body is through a pathway involving a molecule called thromboxane A2. Testosterone and androstenedione, I'm probably saying it incorrectly, but both of them seem to upregulate gene expression of thromboxane A2. Now the reason this is problematic is that thromboxane A2 is involved in platelet aggregation, this involves coagulation, and can involve other things such as increasing your risk for heart attacks and cerebrovascular events. Now a drug that you might be familiar with is aspirin, and aspirin works via inhibiting thromboxane A2, so this decreases platelet aggregation. But aspirin Aspirin also vasodilates vessels. So another mechanism that isn't commonly spoken about regarding thromboxane A2 is that it causes vasoconstriction, which essentially reduces blood flow to the heart and can precipitate a heart attack essentially if you have plaque buildup in this region, because if there's a plaque there and the vessels vasoconstrict or get smaller, then there's a higher potential for lack of blood delivery to a certain area, and this results in ischemia or essentially a heart attack. So when using steroids, and especially on a steroid cycle, I think one should consider the use of something like baby aspirin. Whilst it is commonly prescribed after you have a heart attack or a stroke, I think in the case of steroid use where there have been demonstrated increased events of heart attacks and strokes, although the mechanism isn't really sure, I think this could be a potential way to decrease these risks. Now moving on to one of the most important parts, and that is testosterone and its effect on blood pressure. And this has to do with testosterone's effect on the RAAS system. I'll display an image, but essentially this is the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. And what has been demonstrated with the use of testosterone is that it increases angiotensin II levels. And it's postulated it does this via increasing renin expression. And renin, as we see on this pathway, is responsible for converting a molecule called angiotensinogen, which is produced by the liver, to angiotensin I. Angiotensin 1 then goes into the lung where it is converted by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE and this produces angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 has a variety of effects on the body. It stimulates the production of aldosterone from the adrenal gland. Aldosterone then works on distal convoluted tubules to absorb more sodium and makes you lose potassium. Not only that, but angiotensin 2 also helps absorb sodium. The absorption of sodium causes an osmotic gradient and water follows, and this causes more volume in your blood system and this can cause higher blood pressures. Not only that, but angiotensin II increases sympathetic activity, can result in increased blood pressure, heart rate, anxiety, and also stimulates the production of something called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. ADH, as stated in the name, prevents diuresis, or essentially water loss in collecting tubules in the kidneys or nephrons, and this means you hold more water, and this again worsens your blood pressure. Not only that, but angiotensin II causes vasoconstriction and has negative effects in the kidney. It causes preglomerular vasodilation, and essentially this leads to higher pressures in the glomerulus, and this can precipitate damage to the kidney. What we have seen in the cases of steroid use is that 
FSGS or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis seems to be a bigger issue. And essentially this forms one of the causes of kidney disease and can lead to chronic kidney disease. So kidney disease is seen in those using steroids and I think the pathway to it is via this mechanism. Logically we want to decrease the levels of angiotensin 2 and there are two mechanisms in which we can do this. We can either block the ACE enzyme and that's what ACE inhibitors do, so angiotensin 1 is not converted to angiotensin 2. This includes drugs like catapril, elanopril, lisonopril, and they result in decreases in blood pressure via this mechanism. Or we can reduce the angiotensin receptor stimulation, and this is via ARBs. Now the difference between the two is ARBs tend to be a bit more expensive, but they have similar outcomes in most cases. Some may say drugs like telmosartan are more favorable because it works as a PPAR agonist and can help with cardiac remodeling, but all ACE inhibitors and ARBs have this effect and their decrease in blood pressure is more or less the same. The only reason you'd want to use an ARB over an ACE inhibitor is if you get the cough from an ACE inhibitor, which can only be changed once you stop the drug, or if you have hereditary angioedema. So this is the reason why I think it is important for individuals using high doses of steroids to implement the use of these drugs. Furthermore, both of these drugs have been shown to reverse negative cardiac remodeling that occurs with hypertension or increased levels of mineralocorticoid receptor activation. Now this is a big topic that I'll have to do another video on because it is also very important in the role of steroids and their side effects. But that is the thought process behind ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Not only that, they are also renoprotective, which means that they assist in decreasing damage done to the kidneys, and in a lot of cases can slow down the progression of chronic kidney disease. So then we get on to a drug like nabivalol. Now I spoke in a recent video about another cardioselective beta blocker that is carvedilol, and the reason why these are quite useful in terms of steroid use is because they they help with cardiac contractility and have been demonstrated to assist in increasing ejection fractions and reducing negative cardiac remodeling. Not only that, but they reduce the sympathetic response that your body has to steroids. And whilst the sympathetic response is necessary, around the context of exercise, if that response stays elevated for too long, you run into issues such as a high basal heart rate, which could cause something like a fatal arrhythmia or tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, which I've spoken about in another video. But essentially, it's damage to the heart via having elevated heart rates for too long. So this justifies the use of those drugs. Now, as I briefly mentioned, there is the... So now we get on to the mineralocorticoid receptor. And I think I need to dedicate a whole video to this. So the mineralocorticoid receptor, or MR, is stimulated by aldosterone in epithelial cells, so the cells found in the kidneys. Now the MR is also found in the nervous system, such as the hippocampus, and in your cardiac myocytes and other non-epithelial cells. And this is important to note because testosterone itself, in some studies, has been demonstrated to stimulate the MR in epithelial cells, so in the kidneys, directly, which results in absorption of sodium and increasing blood pressure, which means that you could have cases where individuals are using ARBs and ACE inhibitors and they are not working that well, or what I call resistant hypertension in a steroid user. It's not a medically defined term, it's just what I give it. So in these cases, you have to take a different approach to blood pressure regulation, which I will get on to in a whole different video because it's a complicated subject. But that's just for you to know that in some cases these drugs don't work in reducing blood pressure. But in studies we do have where rats who had high blood pressure as a result of higher testosterone levels compared to those with hypertension or high blood pressure as a result of other mechanisms had a 60% reduction in their blood pressure levels as compared to a 40% reduction in blood pressure levels in those who had high blood pressure as a 
result of a different mechanism. This would show that ARBs or ACE inhibitors are quite effective in reducing blood pressure response to testosterone, whilst it's not 100% effective. But let's summarize what we've spoken about. Testosterone increases a molecule called thromboxane A2, and this can be inhibited by the use of something like baby aspirin. Testosterone also increases angiotensin II, which results in higher blood pressures as a result of vasoconstriction, increased sympathetic nervous system response, and this can be reduced by the use of an ACE inhibitor, or ARB, which essentially reduces angiotensin II activity in the body. Not only does testosterone induce these changes in blood pressure, which in itself can cause kidney damage, angiotensin II precipitates this damage, which is why it is important not only from a cardiovascular standpoint, but from a renal standpoint, that these drugs be used if you are using high doses of steroids. When it comes to beta blockers, cardioselective beta blockers are sometimes needed in those cases where sympathetic nervous system response is overstimulated or in the cases where an ACE inhibitor isn't doing your blood pressure justice. Now we have resistant cases, which I'll speak about in the next video. So this is essentially one of those basic things that you can control when going on steroids. Some may argue that this has its limitations, because of the fact that these studies were performed with high doses of testosterone as opposed to other androgens, but what we've seen in the majority of cases is that any androgen receptor stimulation seems to increase angiotensin II, and we don't know why at this point. Some may ask, do I need this in the case of TRT? In some cases you might. Studies in TRT at doses of 75 to 100 to 200 weekly have demonstrated rises in blood pressure. Now, whether or not this is significant will depend on the individual and their risk factors. So what if I don't have increased blood pressure when using steroids? Is there a reason to use these drugs? Right now, we don't have much data to suggest whether or not you should use it. Logically, one would assume you wouldn't need to. But the only thing that concerns me is a fairly small study that I referenced in a previous video that showed that these certain individuals had high levels of angiotensin II and high blood pressure. They had left ventricular hypertrophy as a result of the high blood pressure. But what was interesting is in these subjects, the right side of the heart was normotensive, meaning that there was no high blood pressure demonstrated in that part of the heart. Cardiac fibrosis was still noted in these individuals in the right side of the heart, even in the case where there wasn't high blood pressures. Whilst you could critique the study in many ways, it kind of supports the fact that even in the case of low normal blood pressures, if you have high levels of angiotensin II or aldosterone circulating in your bloodstream, you still might have these side effects from these hormones on your heart and your kidneys, even if your blood pressure is controlled. But again, this research is very limited, and I don't want to be suggesting the use of ARBs and ACE inhibitors for everyone using steroids, but I think it's just something to think about, and I'd like to know your thoughts on that. So let me know what you think about this video in the comments down below. Would you be interested in having a second video discussing a bit more complicated concepts or ones I think are still important? Anyway, I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching.